Chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5 is where we're going to be today as we continue our message series called The Good Life, The Good Life. And we're taking a look, a deeper look at the Ten Commandments. How many of you memorized the Ten Commandments when you were growing up? Knew what they were, like they were hammered in your head, right? Last week I shared, you know, we're we're kind of, uh, we kind of get nervous when we hear the Ten Commandments because they kind of bring up these feelings of, man, if I break just one, I'm going straight to hell. And we realized last week that the Ten Commandments weren't given, they were not given as a requirement for salvation, right? We don't have to, they weren't given like, you know, one, two, three, four, down the line, Ten Commandments, and, 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 and so if you fulfill all of those, then you have salvation. That's not the case. The Ten Commandments were given because of our salvation. They were given um, to the Israelites after they had been delivered from Egypt and uh, uh, delivered out of bondage, right? And just like they were delivered from Egypt, we have been deli- delivered from uh, slavery to sin And so the Ten Commandments are there for us to live the good life, to live in harmony. This is the best way I could sum it up, to live in harmony with God and to live in harmony with each other. And the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The the last six commandments deal with our relationship with each other. And so if if we have these things going on in our lives, we do them because we love God, not because we're trying to earn our way into heaven or we're trying to get brownie points before God. We do them because we love God. We've already been saved from our sins. So uh, we live by the Ten Commandments in light of the salvation that we have received, all right? So we want to live for God because we love God, and we want to have this good life, this harmony with God and harmony with each other. So last week, we of course looked at the the first, very first commandment, right? You shall have no other gods before me. In verse um, 8, God gives us a second commandment, and it's, you shall not make for yourself an idol, Now, on the surface, these seem really similar. Would you agree? They sound pretty close. They sound like, and in fact, in some traditions, they actually take these first two commandments and they combine them into one and make it a commandment against idolatry. However, I think there's a difference between the two. Uh, In fact, there is a difference. While both encourage us to live a pure life before God, um, they actually address, I think, two separate issues. Uh, Last week, we talked about not having gods before God. The first commandment tells us not to put anything else ahead of God, that there is only room for one throne in our hearts, right? And that that should be God. That should be Jesus Christ. Um, And so we should not put anything else before God. God should be the center of everything we do, everything we are, and that kind of thing. Okay, so that was last week. This week, the second commandment is more concerned with worshiping God in the wrong way or having the right God in the wrong way, worshiping the right God kind of falsely. That's what this commandment's dealing with. So kind of to illustrate this, I read this story. It kind of cracks me up. There's a story about a guy named Dave who uh, got a job in Chicago, and he had to pack up all his stuff and move from home to go to Chicago. It was really a a far way away. And so having to leave his close-knit family, his mother chose to do something really interesting. She took a digital photo of Dave, her son, had it blown up into a life-size portrait of Dave head to toe, and had it mounted on a piece of cardboard. Life-size, his right height and everything, right? Okay, so she had it mounted to this piece of cardboard, and so there's Dave standing in the living room or in the kitchen, wherever she wants to take Dave, in this photo picture of him with this blue button-down shirt, untucked shirt over his khaki shorts, and hands in his pockets and just smiling. There's, there's Dave. They actually, it grew in popularity. People in the town started hearing about Dave in this picture, and they were actually showing up at the house to get pictures with Dave. They actually called him Flat Dave. <laughs> and so it, it became very, very popular uh, his mom would take him everywhere with, it, with her, uh, and Dave, the real Dave, uh, was kind of, it, it kind of weirded him out a little bit. In fact, his brother called Flat Dave, he was better looking than the real Dave. They actually called real Dave uh, Thick Dave. <laughs> so you had Flat Dave at home, Thick Dave in Chicago. 
And uh, he said, uh, Dave says, man, it got really weird. Here, here I was, I'd be on the phone with my mom. I'm in Chicago, and my mom would say something like, hold on a second, I got to load you into the van. He said, it's just weird. And so here's the deal, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it's not that, the problem isn't that they replaced Dave with another son. That's not the problem. The problem is that they were trying to stay close to Dave through an image of him. Does that make sense? All right. This is exactly what the Israelites did when they, they got impatient. Remember, they're standing, they're, they're kind of camped out below the, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and they get impatient with Moses while he's on Mount Sinai hearing all these commands from God, right? What do they do? Well, they come to Aaron, who's kind of like second in command, right? And they say, Aaron, you got to make us a god. You know, take all our jewelry, put it in the fire, and, and fashion uh, the god for us. And so th- that's what he does. And, and uh, he fashions these, this pile of jewelry, gold jewelry, into a golden calf, right? And so just uh, you got to picture this in your mind. Just as God is handing Moses the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments written on them, etched on them, right? The people actually say this in Exodus chapter 32. They've just fashioned this God. Here's what they say. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Moses is getting ready to bring these Ten Commandments down. They're saying, nope, it's this golden calf. This is what brought you out of Egypt. This is the same God as before basically. The difference is now we have an image of him. We, ha- we can actually see him and we can touch him. And so the idea behind this second commandment is that we're not to use man-made representations of God for the purpose of worship. Okay? We're not to use a man-made representation of God or an image of God so that uh, we can worship God. And so God says, let's look, let's look at the second commandment a little cl- more closely here. He says in verses 8 and 9, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. First part of verse 9 says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now here's what's interesting. Just having come out of Egypt, the Israelites had seen what it was like to worship many gods. The Egyptians had many gods, and most of them were representations in the form of animals. And the Israelites had seen this. They had watched the Egyptians bow down day after day, multiple times throughout the day, to these different gods. And God comes along, and He says, I know what you've seen. I know what you've experienced. It is not to be like that. I don't want you to worship an idol. I don't want you to worship an image that represents me at all. Why not? What's the harm in that? And we bring it into, let's put it in modern terms, what if I want to use a crucifix? What if I want to use a picture of Jesus? Or if I want to, what if I want to use something that helps me focus my thoughts as I pray in our minds, right? Well, is there anything wrong with that? And we'll get into that. We'll, we'll start answering some of these questions. What's this look like? So what is the danger? What, what are the consequences of, of worshiping or using an image of God or representation, a man-made representation of God? I'm going to give you three of them just now. If you would, take notes in your bulletins there, and the inside is the message notes on that insert. Fill in the first blank. And that is, first of all, man-made images of God minimize who God really is. And think about that. We cannot capture the true essence of the living God. There is no way. I like what John Calvin wrote. He said this, a a true image of God is not to be found in all the earth. And hence, kind of if it were, his glory is defiled. His truth corrupted by the lie whenever he is set before our eyes in a visible form. So he says, therefore, to devise any image of God is itself impious, because by this corruption, his majesty is adulterated, and he is figured to be other than he is. This is huge. You know, go back to the Israelites for a moment. The Israelites saw no harm in creating a likeness, an image that represented God in the form of this golden calf. 
They said, yeah, let's do this. And, and, and so they meant that golden calf to be a symbol of the God who brought them out of Egypt. That's what they were going to use it for. And so while they tried to honor God with what they thought was a fitting symbol of God's great strength, it actually minimized his true glory. It said nothing of his moral character, nothing of his goodness, nothing of his justice, nothing of his patience, nothing of anything else in his character. It minimized who God was. Today we have, let's go back to the crucifix for a moment. Some of you may have grown up with a crucifix in your home, and there it stood on the wall, Jesus' lifeless body hanging on the cross for, for all to see, right? Jesus' dead body hanging on a cross. What could be wrong with that? Well, it actually minimizes who Jesus really is, because it hides the fact that he was actually victorious over death, right? Right? He had victory over death. There was power there, and he is still alive, and he is alive today. Jesus' lifeless body isn't hanging on a cross, folks. I had a friend uh, when, in my first, very first ministry. I'm a young punk at the time, you know. We go to his house, and we're sitting there, and I look on the wall, and there's a crucifix. I'm like, oh, yeah, now's my chance to get him, right? I said, I said, hey, man, you know, what's the deal with a crucifix? Well, I found out he grew up as a Catholic and all this other stuff. And I said, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, of course, Catholics would use the crucifix as a way to worship God and stuff. And I looked at him. I said, hey, you know, Jesus isn't still on the cross. And it was like a light bulb went off in, in his head. And in that moment, I'll never forget it, he gets up from his recliner, goes over to the wall, takes it down, and throws it in the trash. And I thought, okay, he got it, you know. Jesus is not on the cross anymore. It minimizes what Jesus did for us. That he did die on the cross, but it doesn't show his power and strength over death. It conceals that. While it depicts his love, it depicts his vulnerability, and I think that's great, it hides the fact that Jesus is powerful and he overcame death. So we've got to think about this. God is limitless in his power and in his knowledge, and you can't confine God spatially in a little box, right? Um, he's everywhere at once. You can't confine God in time. What's the Bible say? He was and is and is to come. I mean, there's no way. You can't confine him in time. You can't fit God in any kind of structure, in any kind of painting, in any kind of statue. You can't fit God in any kind of movie, try as they might. And I love what King Solomon said in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, because he gets it. He says, here they build this temple for God, right? So Solomon says, you know what? Even though we've built this temple, here's the deal. The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain God. He understood it. He got it. You can depict God as much as you want. You can try to fit him in a box as much as you want. It's not going to happen. Anything we try to do to depict God simply waters him down. It minimizes who he is. Okay. Here's the second one. Write this in your notes. Man-made images of God or representations of God incite God's jealousy. And that's right here in this passage. If you want to make a man-made image, you want to try to worship God through some kind of representation of God, it's going to incite his jealousy. Look at verse 9. You should not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Isn't that a kind of a strange description of God? That God would be jealous? And we kind of have this negative view of jealousy, right? It's that green-eyed monster, it's that selfish desire, and I want what you have, and I'm jealous because you have it and I don't. It's rooted in selfishness. But on the other hand, there is one appropriate type of jealousy that's rooted in compassionate love. That God's jealousy isn't this insecure or insane or possessive. You know, when you were younger, maybe, guys, you had this girlfriend and she was yours, right? Anyone came close, you got jealous. It's not that. But it's this caring devotion, this intense devotion that God has for us. I like to put it this way. A God who's not jealous over his people is as detestable as a husband who doesn't get jealous over his wife who may be cheating on him. God is that jealous. He, you, if you set up an idol, and a man-made representation of him, he's going to get jealous as, if, as though you were cheating on him because he loves you so much. 
And when we use an idol in worship, when we use an image of God in our worship, we rouse his jealous passion because we're worshiping, again, going back to this watered-down version of who God really is. And God gets jealous, okay? Here's the third one, and that is uh, having these representations of God, man-made representations of God, lead to serious consequences. There are huge implications for us. As he goes on in verse 9, and in 10, uh, he says, uh, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Then he says, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And that's huge consequences. But on the other hand, in verse 10, he says, I, I'm showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And I love these two verses because Here's, here's this command. It, 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 comes, it contrasts those who hate God with those who love God. Anybody, anybody hate God? Boy, I hate to ask this question in church. <laughs> anybody in here hate God? Good. I don't see any hands. That, that's, that's a relief. So the question is, how would we get to that point? How would we get to the point of hating God? What, is that, what does that look like? And it's, it's, it's really simple. You see, you and I today, we could make small little compromises in our faith. And those small little compromises that we might make today have huge implications down the line. And I'll give you kind of an example here, all right? This is just one example of, of all kinds of different things that could happen. But, for example, we might tell our kids today, you know what? You don't have to go to church to worship God. Anybody ever say that? I don't, want, I don't want to see any hints, but maybe you've said that before. I don't have to go to church to worship God. I can do it in my backyard. I can do it on my porch. I can go out in nature and worship God, and that's true. You can do that, but the second generation comes along, and our kids say, hey, mom and dad say I don't have to go to church to worship God, so I'm going to worship God uh, on my own time uh, and when it's convenient, what do they do? Maybe they don't go to church. Maybe they don't show up or whatever, and they kind of drop off. What happens then? The third generation comes along. Mom and dad don't go to church. They don't see mom and dad really worshiping God out in nature and all this other stuff. So what do they do? They fall completely off. Look around this morning. We have whole generations of family members that aren't here today. And I don't want to blame it just on, 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 on compromises, but I can almost guarantee you that's, what, that's what's happened. We made small little compromises as parents, as grandparents and great-grandparents, that led to huge implications down the line where the third and fourth generation, not only did they don't show up in church, they actually, and you may have heard it, and I'm sorry if you have, they actually hate God. They see God as this cosmic guy up there who is ready to smite everybody and kill everybody and judge everybody because we made small compromises. It's a slippery slope. Uh, 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 and so that's what ends up happening today. And what ends up happening, and it's so sad because I've seen it so many times in the years of my ministry, you have parents who are begging God on their hands and knees, please God, bring my children back to church. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. The other side of this, and I think this is amazing, because while the disease of God-hatred continues to the third and fourth generations, the loving kindness of God extends out to a thousand generations toward those who love God and keep His commandments. Now, this is pretty cool. I think it's wild to think about. A thousand generations, that's a very long time. I don't think we have a thousand generations in human history. Or we're pretty close, I don't know. But, but God, I love this because God is far more interested in blessing people than He is in sitting back and judging people. The scales, the scales are tipped. God's character is weighted toward mercy. That's what He wants to do for you. And I say, it's no wonder. Paul tells young Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4.16, he says, Watch your life and watch your doctrine closely. Be careful that you don't compromise. Be careful that you don't just say flippantly these words. Oh, you don't have to go to church. Man, yeah, you don't have to go, but man, it's, you need to be there. It ends up in a whole line of people hating God. Rather than if you love God and keep His commandments, it goes on to a thousand generations. 
And I thank God, man, that uh, my parents and my grandparents made the decision to love God because they're passing that legacy on, and I hope you will too. All right, so how does this apply to us today? What does this look like? You know, again, I said last week, it's not like we have golden calves in the backyard and the full moon comes and we go out and worship these idols, right? And, and, and so what does this look like? If, if you look around the church building, you can go in, in the classrooms and things like that, you're not going to see a whole lot of physical representations of God, right? We just don't have them. But if we looked a little closer, if we looked a little deeper, do we have idols? Do we have these man-made images, so to speak, these representations of God? And if so, what do they look like? I hope you take notes. Here we go. I'm going to give you, I think, five of them, what this looks like. How do we worship God? The right God in the wrong way. Here's number one. We worship the right God in the wrong way when we place seeing above hearing. When we place seeing above hearing. One of, one of the major problems with physical images is that they can easily distract us from hearing God's Word. And Moses makes a point of this in Deuteronomy, way back in Deuteronomy chapter 4 now, uh, he reminds the Israelites that at Mount Sinai, while Moses is up on the mountain, they couldn't see God. The Israelites couldn't see God, but they could hear Him. Look at this, verse uh, 12 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. I never caught this before. This is huge. God reveals himself on Mount Sinai, not through visible images, not by saying, here I am and this is what I look like but through audible words. They heard what he said. He didn't put on a laser light show. He didn't rock out to the latest type of Christian music. He didn't put on a big production. He simply spoke, and the people listened. That was it. All right, so here we are. We kind of walk a fine line today, don't we? we? We live in this very visual age uh, where it's, we, we learn a lot through seeing things rather than just hearing about it. And so here in, in our worship services, we got our big screens, right? We got our projectors. Uh, we got our lights. We, we got our band. We got our drums. And we, we, got, we, got, uh, we, got our, we, even, we even have our cross. Oh, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> we got our cross. Oh, we got our communion table, too. Oh, it's such a beautiful, oh man, beautiful thing. We got our flowers. Ah, oh, man, we got our pews. We, we got all these visual things that help us, I think, in the way to worship God. And so the question is, is there anything wrong with these things? Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> Let me put it this way. If you can't worship God without these things, you might actually be worshiping these things rather than God. These things may be standing in your way, in in your way to God. And more than anything else, when we come into this room, we come to sit at the feet of Jesus who died for us, and we remember through the Lord's Supper to hear what he has to say for our lives so that we can walk out of here and maybe, maybe a change will happen. And all this other stuff that we do in here, this is just fluff. This is peripheral stuff. It's all about God. It's all about God. Now the second one kind of goes along with this first one. We worship the right God in the wrong way when we make particular expressions of worship more important than the essence of worship. So now we have expressions of worship over the essence of worship. Expression, what is expression? Well, it deals with the style of worship. The essence of worship is God. Expression is how we get to God, is how we worship God. We all have preferences in worship styles, don't we? (laughs) I know we do. You guys tell me all the time. I want to sing all hymns. 
I want to do a mix of songs. I want to sing all of modern songs. The music's too loud. The music's too soft. The music could be more expressive. And on and on. I hear it. We all have our preferences. It's okay. It's okay to have our preferences, all right? Here's the deal. On and on, the battle rages, and some churches, unfortunately, they have split over these things. They have divided over these things. They have closed their doors over these kinds of issues. Here's the thing. When we shift our focus from the person of God, from the essence of who He is, to the style of worship, to the, to the, the expression of worship, we're in danger of breaking the second commandment. And again, if you say something like, you know what, I just can't worship unless it happens a certain way. If you say, well, I just can't worship God on Sunday mornings because we didn't do this or the order was out of whack. I can't worship God because the music, whatever. If you're saying that, man, I'm telling you, you're in danger of breaking the second commandment. Something's wrong. Listen, God is bigger. God is bigger than any worship style. And whatever our preference is, as long as we glorify the true God and we focus our attention and adoration on Him, we should praise God for that. We shouldn't sit around and complain. I didn't sing my song this morning. (laughs) Come on! This is about God. We what we do here. These guys on the worship team—they are only—they're not here to perform for you. Trust me. Their hearts are in the right places. They, they want to lead you into the presence of God, plain and simple. They perform for an audience of one, and that one is Jesus Christ. It's not for you. It's not about you. But it's a tool for you to glorify God. Amen? All right. Here's the third one. We worship the right God in the wrong way when we imagine God to be someone we manipulate. We can manipulate. (laughs) Uh, You know, so for years throughout human history, man has loved to, to create these images of God so that they can toy with God. If I do it just the right way, right? then God will bless me. And we're no different today than all of human history, man. You know, we think if I just do it the right way, God will bless me. We want this user friendly God who adapts to our desires, who adapts to our purposes, and we think, if I do it just the right way, then He'll bless me. If I, if I pray a certain way, if I say the exact words that God wants to hear come out of my lips, if I go to church, if I have enough faith, if this, if that, if I have my quiet time with my God each morning, then God is going to heal me, then God is going to make me rich, then God is going to bless my family, then God is going to whatever, you fill in the blank. This is crazy theology. There is no truth in this. this I don't preach a health and wealth gospel. You're going to have issues in life. Things are going to pop up and, and you're going to be like, why is God doing this to me? God's not doing it to you. Satan's doing it to you. But God, I promise you, Romans 8.28, God will make all things work, to the get, work together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. He will use it. No matter how bad it gets or even how good it gets, God will use it for good. And we can't manipulate God with any of our actions. It doesn't work. He will not be manipulated. If we're trying to manipulate God, we may be in danger of of breaking the second commandment. Here's the fourth one. We worship God the right way, or the right God in the wrong way, when we worship Him for a select few of His attributes. A select few of His attributes. I call this the pick-and-choose theology. Maybe you love certain aspects of God. You read your Bible and you go, yeah, man, I love that. That's great. Yep, I'm all for that. And then you read something else, you go, no, that, that can't be God. So you kind of pick and choose, you know. There are those who, who love, they want a God of love, right? They love, they focus on God's love and His compassion and His mercy and His kindness and His goodness and on and on they go. But they kind of leave out the things like God's holiness and His justice and the reality of heaven as well as hell. 
We want to write hell out of the book, right? No way God would do that. And so we pick and choose what we like about God. And man, that's, that's putting a man-made representation in front of God and saying, that's who I want. Other people, they want a God who's, who is holy and big and way out there and sovereign above and beyond any of us. And so they focus on those attributes, but they forget that God is close. He's our Father. He cares about us. And when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And so they forget about that. Listen, we can't put God in a box. We can't pigeonhole God into some attribute uh, to make him an idea that we love. We've got to accept it all, right? That's, that's what he's there for. I mean, he is the God of everything. And so we can't pick and choose. If we are, we're in danger of breaking the second commandment. Here's the last one. We worship God, the right God, in the wrong way. When we dissociate our concept of him from the impact he has on our lives. There's a disconnect here. When we worship God in the right way, and I'm not just talking about Sunday Sunday mornings, I'm talking about every day of our lives. When we worship God in the right way, he will impact our lives. How many of you have been impacted by the by the God? Yeah, we all have, I'm sure. He impacts our lives. And when we really worship Him for who He really is, we leave out these man-made images, He will impact our lives. We live in a country where scores of people, thousands, hundreds, millions of people probably, they claim to have a relationship with Jesus. But when you corner them and you ask them about their relationship and how it impacts, it really impacts their lives, (laughs) they fall flat. They don't have an answer. I don't know how Jesus impacts my life. That's sad. And so listen, if you came in here, if you, if you think you can come in here and sing a few songs and pray a few prayers and feel all tingly all over, <laughs> maybe even get convicted by the sermon, and then if you head out of here and you think you can live however you want to live, you might think you're worshiping the right God, but man, you might be doing it in the wrong way. Because if you don't allow God to impact your life and to change how you live, something's wrong. You can hear all the great sermons you want. You can sing all the wonderful worship songs you want. You can turn K-Love on and Air One on on your radios and the fish on your radio, and you can sing at the top of your lungs all you want. You can gulp down as many crackers and grape juice as you want. But if, but if God does not affect the way you live, you might just have some idols standing in the way of your relationship with Him. Now, here's the strange thing about all this, maybe a mystery, if you will. The same God who tells us, do not make for yourself an idol, an image of him, has in fact given us an image of himself. Who is it? Yep, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15, it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Jesus himself said in John 14.9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. God gives us an image of Jesus Christ, uh, an image of himself through Jesus Christ. And, and we don't know what Jesus looked like. It's not like we sit around worshiping this whatever picture of Jesus. We have no idea. Those are renditions, the ones you buy in the, in the stores and stuff. We have no idea. We don't worship that anyway. But in order to worship the right God in the right way, we need to focus on the person of Jesus, what he did for us, and who he is, rather than this image. When we do that, we find ourselves becoming more and more like Jesus. Our lives are transformed. So we go back, kind of full circle here. The privilege of having the salvation from God goes hand in hand with a responsibility to do what He asks us, to follow these commandments. And so this morning, what's standing in your way? What are you placing above God? What are you saying? I can't, if you're saying, I can't worship God unless, and you fill in the blank, whatever unless is, you may have an idol. And my prayer is this morning that you would abolish that idol and that you would focus on Jesus Christ. There's also-